Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome back to our look at the world upside down. Today we're going to have a chat about the stars and the planets. In the young earth slash biblical creation view of what science tells us are objects in distant space. Objects that obey natural laws that we can understand. So let's cue up the music and get going. The world also says that stars are enormous balls of gas, millions and millions of times larger than our Earth. According to the Bible, however, stars are much, much smaller. One way to prove this is because sometimes in the Bible, stars actually fall from heaven onto the Earth. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I think that you're confusing proof with something that somebody said in a book. Stars do not fall onto the surface of the Earth. First, they're much larger than the surface of the Earth. Second of all, that would be a rather catastrophic event. What we do get on occasion is meteors and meteorites. These are small asteroids or chunks of rock that intercept our orbit from outer space and burn up in our atmosphere and sometimes actually hit the Earth. 65 million years ago, an asteroid striking the Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula was the cause of the demise of the dinosaurs. We've had several such events, and we have craters to prove it. So let's continue. One example is Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now the phrasing of this passage is rather interesting. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heavens. Now is this talking about an event that will occur in the future, and this will be the consequences of that event? If so, I hardly think that this is good evidence for it having happened already, since the event that caused it has not occurred yet. The Bible, unfortunately, is not known for its consistency. And more importantly, the interpretation by some of the Bible is not known for its consistency. Recall the issue with God being a fish. Another example is Revelation 6, verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This is possible because stars are not enormous balls of gas ready to implode. Rather, they are small lights which God has placed within the firmament. This is why a star was able to guide the wise men to the location of Jesus. Matthew 2 verse 9 says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. You know, modern science looking at the historical accounts of the star of Bethlehem is actually very fascinating. In some cases, it's felt to be a supernova, and there are other explanations that can be looked into. Perhaps I'll do a Friday science about the modern thoughts of what the star of Bethlehem actually represented. I think it's a fascinating story. It'll go right in there with... Um, modern science, and the flood of Noah. The reason the star was able to move over the town of Bethlehem is because the star is a small body of light which God has placed within the firmament. If stars were trillions and trillions of light years away, they would not be able to rest over a single town. Well, two quick observations. Every star in the universe is over a specific spot on the earth at any given time. That's because the Earth is below the sky, and there are stars that are 90 degrees above any spot on the Earth, um, including the sun and the moon. The other thing is the idea that the stars move in response to our wishes or whims or to guide us goes right along with the idea that the stars told me when I was 14 that my wife would have brown eyes. Come to think of it, my wife does have brown eyes. Maybe there's something to it. When it comes to the moon, we are told that it is a solid object, something we can land on. Well, actually, the moon is a solid object, and we have landed on it. Hence, Buzz Aldrin's footprint there. 
that's on the moon. We can tell it's on the moon because we can tell that we have landed on the moon because of the experiments we left behind, photographs from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and a host of other things, not to mention the fact we have eyewitnesses. And I personally watched it on TV myself, and I saw the Apollo 17 launch with my own eyes. The Bible, however, says that the moon is something totally different. Genesis 1 verse 16 says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. According to this verse, the moon is a light of its own. You know, I found it very interesting that he chose to include this picture of the moon. First of all, that moon is only illuminated on the left side. Have you ever seen the sun only illuminated on the left side? I don't think so. Second of all, if you look at that one large crater right at the terminus line, oh, about a third of the way down, do you notice that there's a shadow in the rim of that crater on the side towards its illumination? How does that really make sense unless it's a solid object being illuminated from another light source? If you can figure that out, put it in the comments. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you can see the blue sky behind the moon? This is because the moon is not a solid object. It is a light that shines fully at times and partially at other times. Well, that's a very interesting assertion. So tell me exactly how it will shine fully at times and partially at other times. And again, look at that shadow right there. That's a solid object, unless you can tell me how a non-solid or holographic object can cast shadows. I don't know how that would work, do you? This is why the Bible says in Mark 13, verse 24, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Well, the sun shall be darkened. How is the sun darkened if it's above the horizon? The only way I can think of the sun being darkened when it's above the horizon is through a solar eclipse. I have yet to figure out on a flat earth how a solar eclipse could possibly occur. What about nights that there is a new moon? There's no light from the moon during a new moon. The moon has phases, and part of the moon is illuminated, part of the moon is not illuminated. And then there are, of course, nights that the moon is fully illuminated. We call those full moons. When we see the moon during the daytime, we have a lot of light hitting the Earth. That light is diffracted in the atmosphere and gives it a blue color. That blue color is rather strong. Now, the moon can shine through the blue color, so you'll see the illuminated part of the moon. But the blue color will overwhelm the non-illuminated or the dark portion of the phase of the moon. This is easy to demonstrate and easy to explain. Why is this a source of confusion? I don't know. Notice the Bible does not say that the moon will not reflect the sun's light. It says that it won't give her light. This is because the moon emits its own light. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 41 says, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. Notice that the sun and moon have different glories. If the moon was a reflector of the sun, the sun and moon would have the same glories. So science and creation agree that the sun gives out its own light. The moon reflects that light according to science, and according to creation, the moon gives out its own light. Yet only portions of the moon are illuminated at times, and at sometimes the moon's not illuminated at all. The other interesting thing is that if you hold up a ball during the daytime and you can see the moon above you, that ball will have the same phase of light on it that the moon has. That tells us two things. First of all, that the moon is being illuminated by the sunlight just as the ball is, and the fact that they are of the same phase indicates that the sun is a very distant object. This is a simple experiment that we can all do in our front yards the next time you see a partial moon in the sky during the day. You can check this yourself. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. 
make sure you hit that like and subscribe down there. Hit the bell icon so you know when these videos come out. And if you want, stop by the Patreon and join Team Bob. It's only five bucks a month. You don't get anything special for it, but you do get bragging rights that you're on Team Bob.